A very important discussion taking place in Canada and many other Western countries is the legalization of cannabis. Is there any merit to the legalization of this drug? Join us in our discussion on Beacon of Truth. Islam kuch bhi ho Jayenge hum jahan bhi ke Jana pade hume Jayenge hum jahan bhi ke Jana pade hume Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Beacon of Truth, a live program in which we discuss a variety of contemporary issues relevant to today's young Muslims. To help analyze these subjects, we get the views and the expertise of some guests and the general public. Today is our very first live program from MTA Canada Studio. You too can get in touch with us with comments or questions. You can send us your questions via Twitter and Instagram using hashtag BeaconMTA. Today, I am joined by my two colleagues, Farhan Iqbal Sahib and Atal Manan Sahib, both of whom are serving as the Imams of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community here in Canada. Today, we are discussing a topic very relevant to the current affairs. In recent years, we see the trend in many countries where cannabis or marijuana is being legalized for recreational purpose. Here in Canada, for example, the recreational, the recreational consumption of cannabis has been legalized as of last year in October 2018. The online purchases of the drug have already begun, and also the brick and mortar shops for the drug have been opened in parts of the country. So should the government have legalized it? What are some of the health effects, and how can we safeguard ourselves from the ill effects? These and many others are the topics we will cover today. First, let's get a word on the street and see the comments of some individuals about the legalization of cannabis. Um, from what I do know, I think that it would be good for the economy just in terms of businesses. Um, there's already a large audience for it, so I think it's a smart decision in that sense. Um, I think that within adults it'll probably increase a little bit, and within high school age, I'm going to say over the next few years it'll probably decrease. Um, I feel like a lot of high school age kids kind of do it as a rebellious, with a rebellious factor, but if it's now legalized, then it's kind of probably going to decline a little bit. Uh, biggest reasons are one, uh, it is less, it's just like alcohol was legalized, uh, it is less harmful than alcohol. There are many, many scientific uh, research papers about why it is less uh, harmful. I think it's pretty good for the government. They're going to earn a lot, right? But for people, I don't think so because kids are going to follow up, right? So I basically believe that because we allow people to drink alcohol and smoke cigarettes, and we've already proven that both of those are more damaging and more harmful and more dangerous than marijuana, I think that it's sort of ridiculous that marijuana has continued to be illegal and people are facing like a ser serious charges from it, and yet people who smoke and drink aren't facing the same sort of repercussions or stigma. We've just heard uh, a lot of people are making the comparison with alcohol. So let's start with this. Um, why, you know, we'll talk about why the government has legalized it, inshallah. But let's start with the basics. Why does Islam prohibit the use of certain things? And Zakallah Nansa, uh, what we need to realize is that we live in a very interconnected society, more than ever before. And the actions of one individual have a very dire, sometimes, and direct impact on other individual or individuals. So, for example, let's take this scenario that a husband and wife, they're out a Saturday night, they're having dinner with their family, uh, they're sitting in a nice restaurant, they're enjoying their dinner, they're having a good conversation. Uh, the children, they eat some food, they weigh some food. And after finish eating their meal, they get back into their vehicle. The mother, she's worried, she tells the children that make sure you buckle up, you know, and then they hit the road. Uh, the husband, he's driving, he passes one light, he crosses the second light, he's following the speed limit. When he's crossing the third light, it's green for him. And as he approaches the intersection, another car hits him from the side. Now his light was green, and the other side was red. The driver of this other car, he was also out, he was also enjoying. 
But unfortunately, he was drinking and he had one too many. And he was driving under the influence. So his action ended up resulting in the loss of life of three, four individuals. Or we can take another example that, you know, there's a student, she just finished high school, she had good grades, uh, she got into the university of her liking. It's first week on campus, there's a parties happening, you know, she goes, uh, she mingles, uh, you know, she takes a drink, somebody puts uh, some other drug in her drink without her knowing. And the next morning when she wakes up, she realizes that she's been raped. So now all her future is on the line. Will she be able to continue her education with this? Or, you know, sometimes at night, the mother is waiting at home that, you know, my son, will he come back? Where is he? Or that wife who is anxiously waiting, where is my husband? She's calling, no answer, right? And then the domestic abuse. So all of these things, when we put together, we see there is a very horrible picture. And the facts, they tell us that just in the USA, it is the third preventable leading cause of death. So this is the key word, preventable. We are doing this to ourselves. The World Health Organization tells us that over 200 diseases are associated with uh, alcohol consumption. Very similarly, we see that annually worldwide, more than 3.3 million people, they die due to alcohol consumption or related uh, diseases. So all of this, we as a society, we're doing it to ourselves. And this is what the Holy Quran says when it talks about alcohol consumption in chapter uh, 2, verse 220. Allah Ta'ala says, they ask thee concerning wine and the game of hazard, say, in both there is great sin and also some advantages for men. And then Allah Ta'ala says, but their sin is greater than their advantage. So, so it's the social implication. There's a lot of uh, social problems that can be created from this. And this is why Islam is prohibiting the, the outright use of, this, of it, this drug and, and, and other drugs. Exactly. Now, Farhan Saab, you know, some people make this argument that the, when something is prohibited, then there is more use of it because people, you know, they want to explore, they want to try something new. And they give the example of the prohibition of alcohol in the 1920s, how that actually resulted in increasing in the consumption of alcohol. So can we say by legalizing this drug, would it have a, a decrease or an increase in its effect? Actually, it's interesting. A lot of people on, uh, on the word on the street also, we heard that they are making the comparison with alcohol. Uh, first of all, just because there is a harmful substance uh, which, is har which, which is legal, uh, it doesn't mean that we should add another harmful substance. And, you know, so I think the comparison, we're focusing our discussion on, uh, on uh, the use of uh, cannabis. And as Manan Sahib has mentioned, alcohol is also very harmful. And the Quran talks about it, research has shown it. So it doesn't mean that we should add something else to, to that. The other thing is that uh, when we, uh, studies have been done on this issue and they have shown that legalization of cannabis has increased its use. So comparing it to the 1920s where alcohol was prohibited, I think it's not a fair comparison because of a very different environment at that time. It was a very different time. Now we're talking about the digi digital age. We have internet. And after the legalization of cannabis, a lot of people can go online and just order it in Canada. Uh, young people can go and just take a credit card and order it and, it, uh, and get it at their home. So it's a very different uh, time, and so we should focus on, on cannabis. For instance, there, is the re there are research organizations, there is the RAND Corporation that has done research on it, that even the legalization of medical marijuana led to an increase in the usage of uh, cannabis. And uh, there are obvious reasons for that. I mean, there's easier access to it, uh, and more people have become curious about it after legalization. And then there's another study done from uh, Emory University, which also said that legalization of medical marijuana in some states, it, it was correlated to an increase in the usage, usage of uh, marijuana and also an increase in usage of alcohol for adults 21 and over. So these things are all related. And the thing is that when it comes to the law, people have um, a trust with the law. They, they, they have a perception of the law. And if the law is not able to deal with a crisis, and they decide to just legalize it, and that would be the solution, then people's trust in that law is also affected, and it's, it becomes negative. And this is kind of what we saw from a lot of the comments as well, the reason they're uh, comparing it to alcohol, and they say that, you know, it's all that's harmful drug, so let's legalize it. But let's talk about that a little bit more. Um, you know, the, the government, it's given so many different reasons. Uh, it gave the reason that we want to prevent crime, uh, so we can get rid of the black market. We want to keep it out of the hands of the youth. If it is controlled, then they can control who is using it. 
Uh, but after these few months that it has been legalized, we see that these are not the only reasons that are coming out. So what else, uh, Manan Sahib, what else is the government gaining from this legalization? So, Manan Sahib, first of all, you know, we're grateful to be living in a country that we're, by the grace of Allah Ta'ala, uh, most of the time the government is taking these de decisions and it is for the welfare of the society, for, uh, for the good of the general public. But sometimes certain decisions are made and there are other lobbies who are pushing the government to make those de decisions. So even if we look at this, the government's own website, statsgc.ca, uh, it tells us that the projected total or the uh, in, uh, revenue for uh, cannabis use was going to be one billion in the fourth quarter of 2018. One billion, the legal sale. Compared that against the uh, illegal market, which was only about 250 million. So 75% higher through the legal uh, sale of uh, marijuana. And then now a lot of other companies, a lot of other rich people, they're pumping money into this. It's a very hot traded stock. So a lot of people are gaining a lot of money. They're making money due to the suffering of people, the individual. And more often, you know, as Farhansa was mentioning, the teenagers. And now they're able to you know, get this drug easily. They can order it online. And whereas when the surveys were being done, most of the parents, they're saying that our concern is we want to keep it out of the hands of the youth. 69% of the parents were saying this. But now, you know, the government's own website is saying that the sales will increase and they're saying that, you know, we'll get taxable revenue. But at the same time, we need to understand that more youth will have access to it and the market is just getting bigger and bigger. So there is a great monetary uh, amount that's attached to this legalization. Exactly. And one of the main uh, factors pushing towards the legalization of this. Exactly. Thing. Uh, as you heard in the beginning, we're, uh, we're doing a live program, a Beacon of Truth. Uh, you can get in contact with us with your comments and your questions. Uh, you can send us via Twitter and Instagram using the hashtag BeaconMTA. We have a few comments from the viewers. Omar Anwar Sahib, uh, he says that uh, regarding this, uh, this topic we're discussing, that it shouldn't be considered a crime anymore. Other than that, the Jamaat Ahmadiyya Canada must do its best to prevent our youth from falling into this rabbit hole by these information campaigns it is a new challenge and all the best. Uh, Jazakallah Umar Sahib for your well wishes and your support and we hope that you continue to tune in. Now that we have spoken a little bit about the legalization, let's get into some of the health effects. We see that many a times when people are afflicted with family issues, with social issues, uh, perhaps depression, loneliness, low self-esteem, then they, trend, they tend to gravitate towards substance abuse. So why do people turn towards cannabis or other such drugs? Let's hear another word on the street. Like you, you're never going to have like a physical addiction. Like you're not going to like actually need it. It's more of like a want addiction, like a mental addiction. Like a lot of my friends consume daily and they have a hard time stopping. It's just because it's kind of like become what they're used to. Um, well, I will say it does have a lot of positives if it's used properly with the right mind state. I know like I think in high school it's kind of just used as an escape sort of drug but I know that a lot of people in colleges and universities will use it just to kind of wind down at the end of the day or even some people use it for medical reasons, anxiety, depression, things like that. The re research coming out recently clearly shows that uh, there's a detriment to youth especially for brain formation. Last week there was a paper with 14 year olds so that's highly concerning. The reality is because it has been illegal for so long, we just don't have enough research. So I'd want to err on the side of caution just because uh, the, the potency of cannabis today is significantly different than when I was growing up. It's okay, right? I mean, it's, it's fun, it's recreational, it depends, but I know that people are going to get addicted to it. We just heard the comments of uh, some people on the street from the public, and we just heard the comments that a lot of them are mentioning about the addictive properties and they're saying some of their friends who have been using it and, and regularly using it and how they are addicted uh, in a way. So why do people turn towards cannabis or any other such drug when they can become addictions? Actually the young people that I've talked to and that I've counseled also uh, and discussed this issue with them, uh, they say that it, it is isn't due to a number of reasons, emotional or social reasons, and uh, so a young person might take it just out of curiosity because it's available in, in the high school. A lot of people are, con are curious. How does it feel like? Let's try it out. 
Uh, some people might think that it's just cool to, 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 to have it. Um, then there's also the peer pressure aspect to it, and, you know, because if your friends are taking it and your friends are encouraging you to take it, then you decide to take it because it's out of peer pressure that you feel. Then there is also the aspect of uh, celebrities, uh, pop culture. You know, we have celebrities going on social media talking about it, and they say, oh, it's okay, we, we have tried it, it's, it's fine. And so a lot of young people decide to do it because they look up to these uh, celebrities. Uh, another reason could be that people are just simply not aware of the harmful aspect to the, to the drug. They think that it is okay to take it, that it's not too harmful. Some of the word on the street also when they were comparing alcohol to, to, to the drug, and they were saying alcohol is more harmful, well, that doesn't mean that the, this drug is not harmful. This drug is also harmful. Cannabis is also very harmful. So a lot of people have those tendencies as well. Uh, and according to one study published in the Journal of Studies on Alcohol and Drugs, young people may just take it to ease boredom, uh, relieve stress or tension, frustration, escape problems, or even to increase or decrease the effects of other drugs. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the answer is not dr to take the drug, but these are the reasons that people have for taking the drug. And, and you know, many a time people have this attitude that they're just doing it for recreational purpose. In fact, that's what the government has legalized is the recreational use. The medicinal use w had, had been legalized uh, sometime in the past. So what do we say to those usually youngsters who say that we're using it just for recreational purpose? So if I'm occasionally using it, you know, what, what's the harm? Anand uh, Sahib, uh, you know, when we came to Canada in the 1990s, I remember at that time, you know, getting a car, it was a big deal. I mean, getting a new car was out of the question. Uh, it had to be a used car, and even for our parents, you know, you would consult newspapers and you would go see many cars. You couldn't even go to the dealership because you know it was out of the reach. But now, alhamdulillah, you know, the Jamaat has been blessed, the members of the Jamaat have been blessed. So imagine that one of our teenagers today, they're in high school and they just got their driving license and, you know, they want to get a car. So their friend tells them that, you know, I know this great dealership. I'm going to take you there. They have nice cars, new cars. And they're really cheap, you know, dirt cheap. And you're like, really? And your friend goes, yes, yes, let's go. So you go to this dealership, you walk in, and there are two big signs. You know, one says one in six, and the other one says one in ten. And you ask your friend, you know, what is this about? He says, oh, don't worry, we're in the one in six section. So you go there, and the cars, truly, they're really nice cars, top of the line, new models, uh, brand new, all the functionality, all the new features. So you pick the car you like, and you sit down to sign the paperwork. You, you go through the paperwork, and on the last page, you know, there's that small sign, you know, one in six. And you wonder, what is this? And your friends say, don't worry about it, just sign. And underneath, there's some writing, and you start to read. And it says that one in six of these cars, their brakes don't work. We have tried everything possible to fix this issue, but unfortunately, we're unable to fix it. We don't know which car that is that the brakes don't work. But once you sign this document, we're going to take the money and this car is yours. So how many people would get into that car, even though it's super cheap? So similarly, the government's own website, their own research is saying that when we use cannabis, when we use marijuana, even if it's for recreational use, the teenagers, they will become addicted. One in six, 16%, that's a very high number. So the question is that for that small high, are we willing to risk our entire life you know, somebody who's 16, 17 years old, they have 50, 60 years of their life ahead of them. Do they want to get addicted to this drug? As for Hansa was mentioning some of the reasons that, you know, they, maybe they're bored. Maybe they want to fit in. You know, whatever that issue is. But think about it. That do you want to risk your life? And then you say, okay, you know, what about the 1 in 10? And that's what the government is saying, that the older people, even they're at risk. So a family man. You know, he has a wife, children. Are you wanna, do you want to risk your family, your future? So we need to be aware that this is the stats, according to the government's own website, that addiction is real. Even recreational use can lead to addiction. Now, there's a, you know, this drug is very popular with the youth, and I want to touch more about the adverse effects of it, and especially on the adolescent brain, all the you know, damage that it can cause. And our youngsters... Uh, they should know before getting, like you said, the example of the car, they should know what they're getting into exactly. uh, before using something, before getting into anything. So what, how does cannabis impact a young person's brain? It's a very negative impact. Uh, it's because uh, the young person's brain is developing, 
And uh, up to the age of 25, our brains are still developing. And, and uh, scientists, they talk about this. They say that taking this drug at a young age impacts that growth. And a person may not feel it at, right there or at, at that time, but later on in life, they might have difficulties with different things. Uh, there are psychological, neuropsychological impacts. Even if someone takes it and then stops using it, research has shown that those neuropsychological harms stay with them throughout their life. So this is a very long-term impact of this drug. And then there are short-term impacts as well. We, we just talked about how there's addiction. Again, when it comes to addiction, for young people who are taking it, they're more prone to, to becoming addict, addicted to this drug as compared to uh, adults. So adolescents, uh, you know, is, it has a great impact. Then there are mental health issues. I mean, people take it sometimes to get out of anxiety and depression when the reality is that taking this drug throws them back into more anxiety, more depression, even more severe uh, mental health problems uh, like psychosis or schizophrenia. So these kind of mental health problems can also develop for someone who is taking this. Uh, and as we mentioned, uh, the impact on the brain development is also there. So all these short-term, long-term, very adverse effects uh, when it comes to the use of this drug. And in regards to uh, schizophrenia, I was reading in one of the research papers that if, if somebody is already having a predisposition uh, to the uh, to schizophrenia by using cannabis it actually brings on its onslaught even faster right so there's so many uh, detrimental effects and our youth should definitely know the difference now Manasa we know that even uh, the recreational usage of cannabis it can lead towards uh, addiction as we just heard uh, you know for Sabi is telling about the serious and detrimental impacts it can have but there are many other drugs out there as well who can which can cause these damages and does that addiction, can it become like a gateway towards other and more harder drugs? Anansab, you know, if we look at our body, physically speaking, you know, we're built in a way that let's say you want to start playing basketball. You know, initially when you start, you know, you'll get tired in 10 minutes and you're going to have to take a time out, sit down, catch your breath, and then start again. But if you continue exercising, your stamina will, you know, be built and you'll be able to play for longer. Similarly, our tolerance level for whatever we're doing, it builds up. So imagine somebody who's smoking. You know, the first time they smoke, they'll be coughing and they probably won't even be able to finish that first cigarette. But then we have chain smokers who are able to smoke an entire pack in one day. So it's the same thing with this, with cannabis use, that when you take a small amount, you'll get that high. But then as your immune system, as your tolerance level, it gets higher and higher, you're going to have to take a larger quantity. And a time will come when you won't get that high. And you would want to move on to other harder drugs so you can get that same high. And that's why, as Prahansa was mentioning, that cannabis use also leads to alcohol. And then it leads to other you know, drugs that are even worse than this. So all of these things, our youth especially, they need to be aware that this is not something, it shouldn't be taken lightly. That, okay, I'm only doing this for the fun of it or it's recreational use. Uh, it can lead you down a, you know, a path of destruction uh, and it'll cause pain to you, your loved ones. So we need to be aware of the facts. Uh, those who are on the fence about it, they should make a proper investigation that this is not something, a decision that should be taken lightly. It can definitely lead you to the usage of other drugs. And, and harder and harder drugs. Harder and harder so drugs. It's, you really, you're just digging yourself into a deeper and, and deeper hole. Exactly. As we heard in the beginning of the program, one of the main reasons why the government wanted to legalize this drug was to keep it out of the hands of the youth and to safeguard the youth. So let's get a word on the street and see what some young people are really saying. I think it can go either way. Uh, just like alcohol, if the government is able to set right uh, age limits, and just put the right marketing out about how it is important to be responsible when using such products. Uh, I think it will have a very similar trend in terms of usage, just like alcohol. There needs to be a limit with respect to the access to marijuana. So for example, just as though we have an age limit with respect to buying alcohol, it should be the same thing with the uh, legalization. So in terms of youth being able to access it, I'll be perfectly honest, I was smoking weed in the high school and there was access there before legalization. So I think now um, that we have certain barriers in place, I think it will make it a little bit more difficult for uh, uh, youth to actually get weed just for the fact that they don't want to necessarily go to a friend now these days where you know you could actually get 
proper strain of uh, proper herb from the store where it's actually licensed and medicated. As we mentioned in the beginning, as we mentioned in the beginning of the program, uh, Beacon of Truth is a live program, and you can uh, call in and give us your comments. You can, uh, not sorry, call in. You can tweet us. You can use Instagram using the hashtag BeaconMTA. Uh, we can, uh, we'll mention some of the, uh, the comments of the people who are, are tuning in and, and giving us their remarks. Abida Saiba, she, she writes that this is a truly exciting. We will certainly be tuning in this afternoon. May this series not only enlighten, but inspire us as well. I pray it's a grand success, inshallah. Uh, Taslim Ahmad Saib, he writes that looking forward to this new series, inshallah. Ahmad Siddiqui Saab, he mentions, mashallah, great program so far, keep it up. And uh, Jahid Sahib, he shares his thoughts as well. He says that marijuana or cannabis and even alcohol may be legalized in certain parts of the world, but still remain gateway drugs which is a lot of time leads to more harmful substances and more carefree lifestyle. And this resonates a lot with what we have been discussing today. Jazakallah to everyone for your comments. Uh, you can also send us your questions. Inshallah, we will take those at the end of the program. Now, one comment uh, we just heard from the word on the street as well. Uh, even before legalization, there was still easy access to the drug. So now regardless, what are the ways uh, that we can safeguard ourselves? What are the, what are the things that youngsters can do to uh, protect themselves from the harmful effects of these drugs? That is the crux of the issue, really. I mean, uh, whether something is legal or not, uh, our m real concern is, as a good Muslim, uh, should I uh, be using it or not? And how do I protect myself against it? So it reminds me of a story that I've shared many times before. Uh, back in the early days of the 21st century, uh, a South African psychiatrist, his name was Derek Sommerfeld. He went to Cambodia and he wanted to introduce a pill to the people. So he went to the people, he said, I have a pill, I wanted to uh, introduce it to you. It was basically an antidepressant. And uh, the people said, okay, but hear our story first. And they said, well, there was a person here uh, who stepped on a landmine and his leg got blown off and he had this artificial leg put in its place. And uh, because of that, he was very, very depressed, uh, and uh, he was very unhappy. So the people decided to do something. They, said, they decided to get him a cow, and then eventually that cow gave birth to more cows, and eventually this person became a very successful dairy farmer, right? And all, all of that depression, anxiety, and hopelessness just went away. So, you know, the thing is that just as in this case where we have antidepressant pills, our society sometimes has a tendency to turn to these quick fixes. The, you know, let's take a pill and that will fix our problem. So same, the same thing happens with, with drugs, with, the, with cannabis also, that, okay, I'll take the drug and all my stress and frustration would go away and I'll just feel good for, for some time. So that's not the answer to, to our problems. That's not the solution to the difficulties that we are facing. Everyone has challenges. We all have challenges. I have, I have challenges. You have challenges. We look at the life of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He faced so many challenges. At one point in his life, he lost both his uh, wife and his uncle. Very supportive of him in those times of persecution. He lost them both in the same year. Uh, there are so many occasions he, he lost his children, his grandchildren. All these things he had to go through. His, his loved ones, his close friends. He lost them. He had to go through those difficult situations. We look at the life of the promised Messiah, peace be upon him. Uh, he lost his most beloved uh, young son, you know, at the age of eight. And uh, we look at the life of uh, Khalifa al-Masih. He's facing these crises, the persecution, Ahmadis being jailed in different parts of the world. And he faces all of that. What is the solution? How do these people face these difficult circumstances? And the answer is that they turn to God. They have a connection with God Almighty. They are not looking for that sense of belonging anywhere else. They, have, they find their pleasure in God Almighty. In the Holy Quran, in chapter 13, verse 29, Allah says, Allah Allah Those who believe and whose hearts find comfort in the remembrance of Allah. I, it is in the remembrance of Allah, the hearts can find comfort. And you know, when we talk about zikr or remembrance, a lot of people are saying that, oh, we have tried it, it was a big deal. We're not talking about the ritualistic aspect of, of just, you know, reciting some words in Arabic. 
We're talking about understanding those words. We're talking about having a conversation with God, talking to God Almighty. That's what we're talking about, becoming, becoming friends with God Almighty. That's what we're talking about. The promised Messiah, alayhi salam, peace be upon him, says in one place, our paradise lies in our God. This is in Noah's Ark, uh, page 36. He says, our high, highest delight is in our God, for we have seen him and found every beauty in, in, in him. And then he says, O ye who are deprived, hasten to this fountain as it will satiate you. It is this fountain of life that will save you. So if we, are, if we turn to God, if we are resilient, we are patient, we are steadfast, and we are, attach ourselves to good people. In our jamaat also, we have a you know, sense of belonging if that's what we are looking for. We find that good company. We do all of these things. These are the environmental things and our circumstantial things and our social things that can keep us away from these kind of drugs. So his resilience is very important. And in fact, Allah Ta'ala, he says, inna malo siri yusra, that after hardships comes ease. Right. So this is something that our youngsters should understand. No matter what difficulties they're facing, no matter what hardships they're going through in their life, it's going to be a better day tomorrow. And you can always look for that better day and look for that uh, with prayers and, and seeking advice from, uh, from your co close family and from everyone else. Now, instead of legalizing this drug, um, you know, because the government has a lot of uh, resources. They can allocate their resources in so many places. And they saw legalization as one avenue. But could they have taken a different approach? W is there something else that the government could have done instead of legalizing? Uh, Hanan Saab, you know, uh, I have two daughters and both of them, they go to school. So in the morning, every day when I take them to school, there's a stop sign right in front of the school. So usually, you know, when, we, when we're at the stop sign, all the drivers, they stop on their own and they go. But in the morning when the school is about to start or in the afternoon when I have to pick them up, there's a special guard there. It's his duty that during the time when the school is about to start or when school finishes, there's extra enforcement from the government to protect the children, right. right? So now, by legalizing this drug, the government has taken away all that extra enforcement. And they have given it. You know, any teen teenager sitting at home can use their parents' credit card, and they can order it, right? I mean, there are different resources, as you mentioned, the government has. And had it used those resources properly, it could have dealt with the problem in a much better way. One example is that in the 1990s, uh, the country of Iceland, there was a severe alcohol consumption issue. And the teenagers, the drinking, uh, there were so many teenagers involved, the rate was 42%. So the parents, the police, the government, the academia, they came together and they're saying that this is a real crisis, we need to do something about it. So all of them, they came together and they created a program, it was called Planet Youth. And the highlights of this program were that first of all, they said the parents they need to spend more time with their children. And we need to educate the parents, and the parents have to spend quality time with their children. And then they said that the government should give to the parents 650 Canadian dollars equivalent annually so that children can be enrolled in after-school programs. And then they said that the parents should be aware of who the friends of their kids are. They should know where they're hanging out. Then they said that uh, there should also be a suggested curfew where those who are 16 years of age and under, they shouldn't be out on the streets by 10 p.m. And the parents were going out at night. If they saw any teenager, they would ask them, you know, what are you doing here? Why are you here? This and that. So they took this approach. And within a few years, last year in 2018, the rate was at 5% alcohol consumption. So look at that. That's a great success story that where the government was really concerned they introduced more enforcement, they allocated the resources in a different way, and from 42%, it dropped down to 5%. And even if we look at it from an Islamic perspective, you know, Hazur Anwarid Allah Ta'ala bin Asr Aziz, he has been telling the adults, the parents again and again, especially the fathers, to spend time with your children, quality time, especially the sons. Similarly, we find in a hadith, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying that after Isha namaz, don't go out unless you really have to. Right? So if we see all of those things, and then whatever Farhan Sa was mentioning in that aspect, that attach yourself to the Jamaat, attach yourself to the Khalifa, we can safeguard ourselves. And again, you know, we wish the government had not taken this step, because by removing uh, these different uh, you know, enforcements, they have essentially handed to the youth, you know, do whatever you want to do. 
if they had wanted to protect the youth, they definitely could have taken many different measurements. And, and that's the real tarbiyat, I think. Exactly. They're, they're going out of their way to try and cater for the youth, giving them different programs and giving them other things instead of drugs and alcohol. Exactly. I mean, end of the day, you know, we see that teenagers, the youth, they have a lot of energy. You know, that's why even in the Jamaat, we have so many different sports programs, so many different leagues. So that's a great way of, uh, you know, making sure, especially the parents, they need to make sure that they get their children involved in these different activities that the Jamaat has to offer. Jazakallah. Uh, we are live program of Beacon of MTA, uh, Beacon of, MTA, uh, Beacon of Truth on MTA uh, studio is here in Canada. Uh, we are taking the questions uh, from, and comments from the viewers. A few questions have come in from Twitter as well. Uh, Faiza Sahiba, she writes that uh, great show. How do we counter the argument that marijuana helps alleviate pain for some people who suffer pain on a daily basis? Should it be available to be bought over the counter to alleviate pain? So this is a medicinal use of uh, marijuana, and Islam is very clear on this, that when it comes to medical use of something, uh, it is allowed. I mean, uh, for, for alcohol, it's the same thing. If, if a doctor says that you need alcohol to fix a certain medical issue, you're allowed to take it. Islam is not a religion uh, of, uh, you know, making people suffer or putting them in any kind of difficulty. Uh, it is out there. I mean, the whole reason why Islam does not allow these intoxicants is because it's harmful to their health. And now in, in exceptional, rare circumstances, if someone can be prescribed this in a certain amount and that helps alleviate their medical issue, then Islam allows that. But that doesn't mean that it should be available freely for anyone to take it. It should be doctor prescribed and given to those individuals only who actually need it for fixing some medical issue. So for medicinal purposes, for a valid reason, for, uh, it can be used for, 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 for their, for, as a medicine. Right, right. Now another question, this is from uh, Aiza Saiba. She writes that, does it even matter if we are not taking cannabis ourselves and people who use it, they know what they are doing? So I guess she's saying that, uh, you know, it doesn't really concern us. So do we still need to talk about this uh, topic? Do we need to have an awareness about this topic? So, it, it, you know, in our religion, our, uh, uh, you know, in Islam, it teaches us that we should be concerned for the whole of humanity. We have compassion for humanity. We have service to humanity. Uh, one of our conditions of bath in the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat, someone who wants to join, one of the conditions of bath is to serve others. That is what we sign up for, right? That, that we are going to serve others. We are going to be useful to others. So in a country where we are citizens of a country, we have to be loyal to our country. We have, and loyalty doesn't mean just that whatever the government says, we are obedient, but also that we are concerned about our society. So in this case also, we shouldn't be saying that, oh, uh, I should just care, take care of myself. Even if it's legal, other people are using it, that's fine. If they're using it, then it's harmful to their health as well. And then there's another side to these things, that those people who are using it, they're going to impact hospitalizations mm -hmm. on a regular basis. More people are going to end up in the hospital. It's going to increase the burden in the hospitals. And then maybe those people who actually need to go to hospitals are going to find fewer services. They're going to have longer wait times. All these things are impacting the society at large. Already we know alcohol is doing that. And now marijuana may start causing that. So all these factors are there and we have to be concerned about the whole society mm -hmm. and not just of ourselves. And Hanan Sab, even with this, uh, if I can add, that, you know, if somebody's, as in the beginning we were mentioning, somebody who's driving under the influence, it can have a very dire impact on somebody else. Yeah. So if I take this approach that, you know, uh, if somebody wants to take marijuana, they can take it. If that individual is driving and they get into an accident, it can cause loss of life to somebody else. So this is another reason that we live in a society and the government gives us this right that we can have this disagreement and uh, we can have this discussion. And that's why we're doing this. Jazakallah, gentlemen, one more question. Uh, the question is, does someone who intakes marijuana for medical purposes come under the same ruling as someone who drinks alcohol or any other intoxicant? So we already covered that and, and the answer is no. And that was from Sidra Saiba. Fariha Saiba, she writes, uh, legalization was done mainly to stop marijuana-related crimes. Do you believe this as well, or do you believe this will work? And uh, yes, that's the question. Does, will it work? Actually, uh, the issue is that uh, there is some research that I have, in, f in fact, with me, which is showing that it is not 
in some cases. Uh, um, it's, it's not possible for us to have a sweeping statement because uh, this is still new and uh, there are not very a lot of places where recreation, recreational use of marijuana is allowed. So let's see in the future how it works out. But there is some research that has already come out that is saying that along with the legal availability of the drug, there is the, uh, the black market is still there and it's still growing because there are restrictions. For instance, the age restriction is 21, but these black market people want to send, sell it to even younger Youngsters, people, yeah. right? So, so it's, it's that, you know, uh, give and take situation. Let's see how it works out. But right now, the numbers that we, see, that we are seeing are not very good, that the, this is going to keep on increasing even with the legalization of marijuana. I do understand the argument that the government is saying that once we have legalized it, it will impact the black market will reduce crime. Maybe in some cases it will re reduce crime, but in the broader sense, it has just given way more access than before to the same harmful drug. And one last question. This is from Yasir Khan Sahib. He tweets that legalizing cannabis in the UK will reduce a lot of gang-based crimes in the UK, which is currently pretty high. So what can we, we say about this? I think you've already covered it. Yeah, I've already covered that. Yeah. And as uh, Manan Sahib, uh, you talked about the planet youth, right? It's, a, it's an excellent example. Why, why can't we have that kind of environment built which gets rid of these gangs, which gets rid of this uh, uh, youngsters walking around in the street and getting into wrong things? Why can't we have those, that same kind of model uh, that you have talked about that, uh, that can help this? And again, Manan Sahib, if there's one wrong, the answer is not to do another wrong to, you know, right that wrong. Whatever is wrong, we need to come up with the proper way of trying to rectify that wrong. So if there's crime involved with marijuana or other things, uh, we need to take a proper approach to this. It's not that, okay, we do another wrong. And because that also is a very slippery slope, then, then where do you stop? I mean, there are so many other drugs, and why not legalize them, somebody can ask. It's a very slippery slope. Jazakallah. This is a problem and a growing problem which is facing our society. Uh, but as you heard, there are successful models out there. Uh, example, uh, Iceland. And as we heard, the parents, they are the ones who can play a very vital role uh, in safeguarding the youth and safeguarding the youngsters. But this requires a great deal of understanding. It requires a great deal of communication. So to those parents who are listening to our program, we urge you to have an open and candid discussion with youth, with your youngsters, and to the youth who are facing this issue and they wish to seek help, and you should wish to seek help, there are so many Jamaat channels that are available to you. There's so many people that you can speak to for advice, for help, including our imams and our missionaries. You can always write to the Khalifa of the time for his advice and especially for his prayers. And it is a great blessing in this day and age to have someone who is your ardent uh, lover, who is there as your most well-wisher, who wants just the best for you. So Jazakallah for Han Sahib, Jazakallah Atal Manan Sahib. Uh, thank you for tuning in and joining our discussion we, uh, on this very pertinent issue which is affecting our society. Please do send us your feedback and your comments at our Twitter handle at beacon underscore MTA. You can also email us at beacon at mta.tv. Join us again same time next week at 1900 GMT on Beacon of Truth. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you all. Jana Pade Hame Jaye Geham Jaha